these two nuns going home from the hospital where they worked in Belfast. And it was the evening in, in, in the winter, and it was getting dark, and don't they run out of petrol? And they were a mile from the petrol station. And so they looked under the bonnet, under the hood, and they couldn't find a gas can, but they did find a bedpan. <laughs> And so they said, well, this is all we have. They went to the petrol station. They got, they got it full. I don't know if you have realized, but when the bedpan is full, it's very unwieldy. <laughs> and so one of the nuns was un unscrewing the cap there, and the other one was trying to balance this bedpan. And doesn't a big limousine <laughs> screech to a halt? The window, fancy one, the, the window rolls down by itself. Who's there but? the Reverend Ian Paisley. <laughs> he sizes up what's going on with the one nun unscrewing the hat and the other one balancing the big hand and he says, Sisters, I don't agree with your religion, but I do admire your faith. <laughs> Exam, there was an ace in the hole, and it was called the prayer to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> now, if you said this prayer, you, we thought, and it didn't turn out this way actually, we thought that there'd be an instant infusion of wisdom into our heads. And as I got older, I looked at this prayer more carefully, and I said, wow. And whoever constructed this prayer really had their head screwed on right. It didn't have anything to do with abusing knowledge. There's a mention of wisdom there. But as I looked at the prayer, I realized what it was all about. And on the way, to, way down here this morning, I realized that it's about hearts and enkindling fire and love and creation and renewal and light and last but not least, rejoicing. So those of you who remember it or know it, let's say it together. I find it always a good way to start. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful with the light. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created. You shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O oh God, you instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant us in that same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in the Spirit's consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Use your imagination a little bit and make believe that this is a scroll. The Spirit of God is upon me. God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to announce the year when God will save God's people. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. And all the people in the synagogue, it was the Sabbath, just as today is the Sabbath. They had their eyes affixed on Jesus, and he began speaking to them. This passage of scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. That's from Luke 4. And uh, that's, of course, Jesus' uh, inaugural speech. And then he went about recruiting folks to help him. Okay? 
And in the very first chapter of the very first gospel written, Mark's gospel, we have this. Jesus walking along the Lake of Galilee, uh, recruiting uh, freshmen for Discipleship 101. And he gets Peter and Andrew and James and John, they leave their boats and they come and follow. And then the next thing you know, there's an abrupt change of scene. Uh, he's in the synagogue at Capernaum the next Sabbath day. Okay? And this is what happens. They came to Capernaum, and on the next Sabbath day, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people who heard him were amazed at the way he taught. He wasn't like the teachers of the law. Instead, he taught with authority. Just then, Gospel writer says, just then, like, wouldn't you know, just then, a man with an evil spirit comes in and screams, what do you want with us, Jesus? We know who you are. You're here to destroy us. I know. You're God's holy messenger. Jesus commanded the spirit, be quiet and come out of the man. And the evil spirit shook the man hard, gave a loud scream, and came out of him. Now the people were all so amazed that they started saying to each other, what is this? Some kind of new teaching? This man has authority to give orders to evil spirits and they obey him? And so the news about Jesus spread quickly everywhere in the region of Galilee. Okay, why are these two stories joined together consecutively in the first gospel ever written in the first chapter? Well, I'm not an exegete. But Sister Joan Chittison is, and she's one of my favorite theologians. And at a fundraising thing at Call to Action about 10 years ago, she gave this insight. She said, these two are meant to be read together. What's the point? The point is this. Jesus is saying to his new recruits, look, you want to know about discipleship? The first rule of discipleship is when you see evil, you confront it on the spot. You don't say, Usher, will you show this man where the coffee is downstairs? <laughs> you don't say, sir, could you come back on Thursday between 2 and 4? That's when I have office hours. You confront the evil on the spot, okay? Young recruits, registration is still open. You can change courses. But if you want to know about discipleship, no confrontation of evil, no true discipleship. Those who can stomach that, come along and follow me. The others sign up for a different course. Now, in my view, that's the moral imperative of discipleship and of activism. As Jesus telling his disciples what it's all about. Thank God for people like Joan Chittister. I want to point out something about what happens after that, because I think it has to do a lot with some of what we experience. Anybody remember how Jesus was received uh, after the initial enthusiasm? You know, who was this great teacher? What happened? They tried to throw him off. Yeah, <laughs> they tried to throw him off the cliff, right? Who are these guys? These were what I call the townies. <laughs> All right. Who is this guy? know him. I mean, his dad and mom would come from very humble circumstances. I mean, who the, who the hell does he think he is? Talking to us like this, the spirit of God is upon me. God has anointed me. Oh, give me a break. All right? Have any of you experienced that kind of reaction? <laughs> huh? I mean, I don't just mean townies outside of you. I mean the townies inside your head. You know, like, who are you? And what kind of reinforcement do you get? Sometimes not, right? I remember being at my 50th reunion at Fordham University, Fordham College. And there was a, a young, younger fellow uh, from the class of 
65, I was a big general. His name was uh, Jack Keane. Some of you know that he was one of the authors of this surge policy in Iraq, which was really a nice word for ethnic cleansing of the city of Baghdad. He got up and he was talking to us in a special little session since he, his was the 45th year class, right? He was talking about what a terrible threat Iran was working on a nuclear weapon and just about to get a nuclear weapon. And I knew that was a lie. And I knew that he knew that was a lie. And since I'm Irish, I didn't think twice. I just said, General Keene, with all due respect, that's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> now, why did I mention that? Because of the townies. <laughs> my friends. My classmates. Yeah, they used to have a good bit of respect for me. Huh? Uh, we were great friends. Some of us went eight years together, Fordham Prep as well as Fordham College. And they were completely confused. They said, well, Governor, what are you doing? I said, General, he's on the, he's on the Board of Trustees now, General King. <laughs> he's got a lot of money. How can you, he's, he's got four stars, he was the Vice Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. How can you pretend to know more money, more than he does? I said, I'm not pretending. I do know. That's what the intelligence agencies say. All 60 of them say that unanimously, all right? He's lying. Oh, well, you know. Well, who are these townies? These townies are people who think they know what's going on because they read the New York Times from cover to cover every day. And it's not in the New York Times. Who's in the New York Times? General Jack King. So this was just sort of a kind of a painful reminder of whatever whatever what the Germans call format, whatever respect that you build up among your friends and, and your neighbors and even your family, you know, you risk that if you step out and confront lies and evil on the spot as we're all told to do. Now the first thing, of course, is to speak out. And all of us are speaking out in, in many different kinds of ways. The next Next thing, of course, is actions speak louder than words. You might have to do that too. But I'm reminded of some prophets that uh, have been around these days. One of my favorite ones is Monsignor Romero, who said, Ser cristiano hoy en día significa no temer, no callar por miedo. Okay? To be a Christian today means not to be afraid and not to be silent out of fear. Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in his incredible letter from the Birmingham City Jail, which I think is a masterpiece of American literature, said many things, but one thing that sticks out in this connection is how he compared the situation to a foil. Now, <laughs> And when I was an adolescent, I had boils on my neck and so forth. I, mean, I know what that's like, okay? When I've talked about this before, Medea Benjamin has said, okay, Ray, that's too much sharing. That's enough sharing. <laughs> too much sharing. Okay. So I, I won't share anymore about what a boil is like. But I will share what Dr. Dr. King said about it. He said, like a boil that can never be cured as long as it's covered up, but must be opened with all its pus flowing ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light, so too injustice must be exposed with all the friction its exposure creates for the light of human conscience and for the air of national opinion before it can be cured. That's what we're in the business of doing. We're trying to show that uh, despite all the problems we have in getting the word out, that injustice needs to be confronted on the spot, needs to be composed, needs to be exposed, and the Jack Keens of this world need to be confronted just like that fellow in Capernaum. Now, how did we get here? How do we get to the point where our country 
is in such trouble and is such used to be a paragon of justice in some ways, at least people used to look up to us, and now it's quite different. Well, I find that I've learned a lot from my grandchildren. We just had our ninth last week, okay? Five girls and four boys, what a joy, okay? Now, this goes back a ways, but uh, my grandson Ronan was in, uh, was in nursery school. And I got to the chance to proctor an exam there. Well, <laughs> it was to help the nursery school teacher, right? So I spent an hour and a half there. And after it was over, I went up to her and said, now, these are really cute little kids, four-year-olds. And I said, what? <laughs> what do you hope to teach these kids at that age? And she said, Mr. McGovern, that's very easy. Come on over here. Sit down. So I sat down in this chair. There were six chairs around at the table. She said, how many toys do you see on that table? I said, four. She said, how many chairs? I said, six. Mr. McGovern, you get it? I said, what do you mean? Can you teach them the first thing they need to learn is the how to share. Four toys, six seats. They have to learn how to share. That's what they teach them. And I said, was like, wow, you know? At that time, it was Bush and Cheney. They, they never went to nurse, uh, this nursery school. <laughs> but it goes back farther than that. You know, it's not when the Soviet Union caved that we became the sole remaining superpower in the world. Empire. I have to say, just being back in New York, seeing the Empire State. We know what empire means, right? Okay. So, what I want to do is, is put this into so some historical context, at least for my, my lifetime. And that was right after the war, and I was around during the war. You know, I was born one week before Hitler drove his tanks into Poland. I don't remember a lot about the early days of the war, but I remember the all-pervasive atmosphere of war as I grew up, as I waited in line for a quarter pound of butter and that kind of stuff. Okay. As I saw the lights in my neighbor's windows for the fallen people of the war. Well, after the war, we emerged. <laughs> wow. Almost, you know, we lost a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of men. But our country was unscathed. Russia destroyed. How many people did Russia lose during the war? Anybody 20 know? Million. 20 million. Say it again? 20 million. 20 million at least, okay. Germany devastated. A lot of Europe. Oh, wow. Yeah. We're really sitting pretty high. So we had to devise a policy, okay? Now, in 1948, George Kennan, who was the head of the newly created Policy Planning Council, the State Department, wrote the first policy planning document. And it said, and this is a virtual quote, uh, we control 50% of the world's resources, but we only compose 6.3% of the world's population. Therefore, our policy has to be devised in such a way as to maintain this disequilibrium. <laughs> we can't be diverted by thoughts of civil rights or democratization or this kind of thing. The time will come when we have to resort to hard power. 1948. That was a year after the CIA was formed. And George Kennan was one of the prime movers in diverting the CIA from its primary mission to tell the president what's going on to one of covert action. And so in 1953, what's that to, it's five years later, when the duly elected premier of Iran decided, hey, you know, this oil that's under our ground, you know, maybe the Iranian people should share some more of the, of the revenue from this oil, decided to, to nationalize the oil. Well, the British took us by the, you know, British knew how to do this sort of thing. And they took this young fledgling CIA and said, look, when some upstart uh, uh, third borough guy does this, this is what you do. And so we overthrew Mossadegh, the 
Prime Minister of Iran, and that was the beginning of what we're seeing even today. So the idea of covert action, well, we just have to do what's needed to maintain this, this equilibrium, okay? And that continues to today. So the person I'd like to quote is uh, a fellow who was the head of the Jesuits uh, about two decades ago. His name was uh, Peter Hans Kolvenbach. He was a Dutch person. And he made a really important point. And his point very simply was, um, what's necessary to be a Christian, what's necessary to, to have the kind of compassion that Jesus taught us uh, is personal experience with innocent suffering. Personal experience with innocent suffering is a catalyst for feeling, for thinking, and in the best of all worlds for doing. Okay. Now, my granddaughter Claire was watching me one time when I got on Lara. I used to get on Lara about every two years, but no more. <laughs> and, uh, and she ran to her mother, our daughter Kathleen, after I was finished with my spiel, I think there was a new director of the CIA and I was commenting on that. She said, Mommy, Mommy, Claire was four. She said, Mommy, that, that's Grandpa, that's Grandpa. And Kathleen says, yeah, Claire, that's Grandpa. She said, well, Mommy, Mommy, that means the rest of the people are real too. <laughs> that, that's cute, right? <laughs> but think about what that means, folks. Think about what that means. If you don't know someone in the picture, the rest of the people might feel too. Huh. When I talk, you know, in the suburbs of Washington, and I ask, like the Knights of Columbus or the Chamber of Commerce, I said, how many people have a, a blood relative in, in Iraq or Afghanistan? <laughs> no hands go up. None. Well, how many people have a have someone they know in Iraq? Well, maybe maybe five out of a hundred, okay? I do that little same, that same question in a Baptist church in Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> And after the first question, 40% of the people go up. After the second question, 80%. Ain't fair. That's the way it is. So unless you know somebody in the picture, and I'm not talking just about US people, of course. I'm talking about people in Iraq now. If those of you who will be uh, have the treat to hear uh, Kathy later, uh, you'll hear about uh, seeing the people in Iraq and what happens after a missile strikes and that kind of thing. So what I'm, what I'm saying here is that uh, um, so few of our neighbors, so few of us have had this immediate experience with innocent suffering that uh, you know, we need to be aware of that and uh, either get it or reflect on it or encourage others to do it. One thing that, that really uh, struck me this past 10 days or so, uh, I watch Amy Goodman in the morning, Democracy Now! Now, I've since found out that I don't have to get up every morning at 8 o'clock. <laughs> I wish somebody had told me that, you know. <laughs> but before that, you know, I have to get, I set my alarm for 17 minutes before 8, okay? Because it takes 17 minutes for an Irishman to brew a decent cup of coffee. <laughs> and I thought I had to do the, I'm retired, I can, you know, I could sleep in, but I always want to watch Amy. Now I, now I know that you can you plug in your computer anytime of the day and get the live, you know, live in quotes thing. Anyhow, she had this wonderful, wonderful segment on the, uh, the Native Americans, the First Nation folks uh, uh, going down the Hudson and the incredible, incredible sharing of the, of the Native Americans there. And uh, it reminded me, I mean, you can still get it, you know? Just go on democracynow.org, and <laughs> it's right there, OK? And you know, if I forget to say it, if you don't do anything else, watch Democracy Now every, every 
every day, you know, or, you know, you go back and see what's been covered. You're not going to watch the whole thing, but I always watch the whole thing because I've learned more about American history and civil rights and all that kind of stuff from Amy Goodman than I have anywhere else, okay? Now, um, well, so that reminded me of the Choctaw Indians. Anybody know about the Choctaw Indians? Okay, yeah. Battle of the Journey of Tears or whatever, yeah. Now, did you know the Choctaw Indians, about seven years after their own excruciating journey, collected $84 for my Irish antecedents going through the potato famine? Did you know that? I didn't know that until Mary Robinson, the previous uh, head of, of Ireland, came over to thank the Choctaw Indians. Now think about what they had just been through. They knew about innocent suffering, right? Okay. And yet they collected when they heard these people starving, couldn't get any food, they collected this money. Now $84 was a lot of money in those days, I think, you know. So, um, so that's the kind of thing that I think we need to be sensitive to, and to remember, and to spread around. And how about actions? Well, you know, I spent a lot of time in Germany. I have a lot of stories about Germany, but one that may be apt here has to do with, uh, um, after the war, the Catholic Church in Northern Germany destroyed, completely destroyed. Five years, they picked up all the pieces, they tried to get it all together, and uh, they were going to have the reopening of the church, but the parishioners came to the pastor and said, Herr Pfarrer, I still do, it, it makes us sad, we are sad to tell you that we can only find the torso of Jesus, but we can't find, we can't find his hands, okay? So we can't open it, we can't, he says, well, don't worry about it, pain the angst, come in the morning, we're going to celebrate. When it came in the morning, the big crucifix was there with the corpus of Jesus on it. And instead of the hands, or underneath the, the corpus, was a little sign. I don't have any other hands but yours. That's the way it is, folks. That's the way God left it with us. And should we be daunted by that? Yeah, I don't think so. I, we can only be taught that by that if we have religion and we don't have faith. <laughs> okay? What I mean is, here's Moses, you know. All right, Moses, uh, I want you to free, free the Israelites. Right. <laughs> Bill Cosby did yes, that yes, yes. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> but, but let's get back to the real Bible. How am I going to free the Israelites? And what does God say? <laughs> I will be with you. I will be with you. Wow, can we believe that? That's what faith is all about. And sometimes it comes from grandchildren. My eldest grandchild is 26 now. Back when he was living in California 21 years ago, he's on the phone with me, right? And uh, I say, Matthew, Matthew, I, I, I wish that you, you know, I wish that you don't know, live way in California. You know. I wish that you don't know, live so far. He says, <laughs> Grandpa, silly Grandpa, I know that so far. You live so far. <laughs> Get it, folks? The next time I thought about, oh God, where are you? you know, how come you live so far? I hear, oh, 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 you dumb McGovern. <laughs> I know that so far. You live so far. So, can we really believe that? I think we can. I mean, I have the privilege of looking out at all you guys. Okay. That's big. Because I see there are enough of us here. Um, standing here. I can see it. It's sort of less obvious when you're just sitting like you have to. So let me ask you just for a minute, turn around 
and see what wonderful companions you're with this morning. All right, now, actions. So, if God lived not so far and we're empowered, which we are, that's our faith, um, what are we going to do? There's a Kairos moment right now. People are becoming aware of the injustices in our society and the way that our Constitution, that almost sacred document, that document that I swore a solemn oath to support and defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic, an oath that many of us have sworn, not only on the officers like me, an oath that has no expiration date, okay? I can even check with some lawyers. Yeah, no expiration date on that oath, okay? Well, we know what's happened to the Fourth Amendment, right? But the Washington Post is now acknowledging what happened to the Fourth Amendment. Yesterday, big front page article at NSA, Int National Security Agency, internal audit found that over the period of just one year recently, uh, our laws were violated no fewer than 2,776 times just out of CIA, just out of NSA headquarters. Okay? Now, what's the big deal? Well, number one, the fact. Number two, the post put it on the front page. Another front pager? The FISA, the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Well, the head of the court says, you know, we don't, I mean, we don't really have any way of verifying what, what NSA tells us. I mean, you know, they tell us that we go back to our power. No. Well, we all knew that, but the guy is saying it, and the Washington Post is printing it. Okay. Now, this is just the, the, the top of the iceberg, it seems to me, because there are a lot of uh, indignities, there are a lot of injustices, particularly with respect to our our black brothers and sisters, and our Hispanic brothers and sisters, and all these other things that need to be addressed. But I think this is, uh, this is a Kairos moment. And I think that one of our, our challenges is not only to expose these injustices, not only to find, and I hope that, you know, it doesn't seem so daunting if you have a small supportive group. I mean, that's the ethos of the Church of the Savior, where I come from. You don't do anything by yourself. I used to try to do that. <laughs> no more. I have a support group, five people who meet regularly and keep me from doing really dumb things. You know? So I really encourage you to do that. Small group, no more than six or seven, preferably four or five. Okay? Just make sure there's at least one woman in this group because I find that the women have all the guts in this world <laughs> face injustice. And I'm not just talking about the Medea Benjamins, I'm talking about people right here. Okay. And meet together regularly every week. And you'll be surprised at what comes out of that, what gets catalyzed from that fellowship that none, none of you individually would have thought of or would have had the courage to do. I'm talking about support, mutual support, and accountability. You know, if you say, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going uh, to go to the senator's office this week, you know that the next week you're going to be asked, well, how did that go, right? <laughs> how So that's, that's kind of the ethos that I subscribe to. And, and the other thing that I'll say is, is that uh, in the beginning here, uh, we found out a little bit about the demography of this little audience here. And uh, we were asked about young people. And uh, we left. And I'm reminded of my Russian teacher in college. We used to act up. She had she had pretty good English, but she didn't realize that laugh was not a transitive verb, okay? And so she would say, What are you laughing? Who who are you laughing? This is nothing to laugh. <laughs> my friends, the fact that there are so few of us under 40, he's nothing to left. 
I don't know what we can do about it. All I know is that we need to pray real hard. We need to find out in these small groups how to catalyze this. But there is one sure way that I find is effective, and that is let yourselves get beat up. Now, let me explain myself. That it seems to be a little bit uh, strange. But okay. Now, when Hillary Clinton came to give a speech at George Washington University, I learned about it. And it was a small auditorium. and they didn't want any people like me coming. So I called a friend that was on the faculty. And I said, can you get me a ticket? And he said, why? I want to hear Hillary. All right, well, he did wangle me a ticket. Now, getting into that auditorium, you had to go through about three of these barriers, you know. They took my laptop, looked at it, made sure that MS Word was MS Word and wasn't a bomb, you know. And I get in there an hour ahead, and I'm sitting down there, and I'm saying, you know, this is really this is weird. <laughs> now, I had my Veterans for Peace shirt on, okay. And when she came in, she was treated to the kind of ovation that I witnessed in the Soviet Union. One of, the, one of the Soviet leaders got up. It was effusive. It was, it was, the word, well, it was, anyhow, it was overdone. And the, and the, and the, uh, and the, the president gave us a very flowery effect. And people kept standing, and, and I said, this is too much. And I took off my outer shirt, and I turned my back, and uh, all she could see was, you know, the www.veteransforpeace.org. <laughs> We're going to have my thing in. And there were 18 cameras around at the back, you know. So I just stood there peacefully. And I knew how to do this because I had done this in, in, at church uh, to protest the sub subordination of women at the, my Catholic church. So I'm looking at, you, you fix your, your gaze on a, a point in the back there. And, and it's a minute and a half, it's going really, really well, you know. And now all of a sudden I see this great big guy look like a Redskins uh, football player reject, you know. He's coming down like this, you know. And I say, oh, wow. What's going on? Then all of a sudden, taken down from behind, the uniform guy, and it was on. Grabs me, and the, the other guy, they lift me up, carry me over the three women that were between me and the aisle, and rip me out, beat me up pretty bad. Um, I'm taken to jail, booked, fingerprinted, all this sort of stuff, and I'm uh, accused of disorderly conduct. Now, what, what's the point of all this? was captured on film, right? Amy Goodman gave it five minutes. <laughs> okay? Now what happened? My Veterans for Peace colleagues raised holy hell about it, okay? And they said, this guy is 71 years old! <laughs> 71 years yeah, I didn't much care for that. But that <laughs> and somebody said, a cancer survivor. Cancer survivor. Whoa! Now, did Hillary Clinton get some emails and calls and Man, she got, she got tens of thousands of calls. I know that for a fact. So, what am I saying here? You guys with a little bit of gray in your hair, you got a terrific advantage. <laughs> Young people get beat up. Bam, you know, just off starts, you know, rogues. Or kids just pains in the ass, right? But old people, okay, people take notice of that. And who else takes notice of that? Young people do. They say, who? They're interested in that. So, you know, it's sort of a strange thing to be encouraging people to do, but, you know, you have this uh, big advantage. Think about putting it into play, okay? And I know, in a sense, I'm preaching to the choir because several of you have indeed put that into play. Now, let me finish here. Um, I guess uh, I would just... Uh, warn folks that, uh, you know, there is such a thing as too late. Uh, Dr. King had a beautiful part in, uh, in a speech on Vietnam, saying that uh, there is such a thing as too late. And I want to draw just one more story from my German experience. Now, some of you know about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right? Yeah. The Lutheran pastor who stood up and did the confessing church and was one of the few church people who who actually tried to do something against Hitler. He was hanged, of course, uh, toward the end of the war as the Allies 
But there's another fellow I'd like to tell you about. His name is Albert Haushofer. Anybody know about Haushofer? Good! I'm going to tell you about Haushofer, okay? He was a geolog, okay, a geologist at the University of Berlin, and, you know, he had, a, he had tenure. You could, many of you know what tenure is, right? <laughs> okay. And how did he get tenure? By keeping his mouth shut. Yeah. Now, he had a conscience, and as his Jewish friends get rolled up, and they said, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Gated a, a little following around, became a threat, and he was wrapped up and put in a different prison from, from uh, Bonkerf in, in Berlin. Now, the, the Germans were always very, very meticulous, and they wouldn't shoot you or hang you, which were the two methods to execute people like this, until you had confessed. Yeah, so a confession. A household folk wouldn't sign a confession. So as the Allies approached, they shot him. Now, as they picked them up off the floor, uh, 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 a little piece of paper <clears throat> came out of his pocket, and uh, Schultz. It was his confession. Schultz. Anybody know German? Mm -hmm. Guilt. Okay. He had written his confession in the form of a of a sonnet, and I'm going to read it to you. I believe that I'm reading it to you. Schultz. Oh. Bin ich schuldig, aber anders als ihr denkt. Ja, yeah, I'm but it's not what you're thinking. Ich musste früher meine Pflicht erkennen. I should have earlier acknowledged my, my duty. Ich musste schärfer Unheil, Unheil nennen. Ich muss, ich, ich, I should have more sharply, schärfer, recognized Unheil, recognized evil, evil as evil. My Urteil habe ich zu lange gedenkt. I put off my judgment for too long. Ich habe gewarnt. I did warn, and he did. Aber nicht genug. Anybody know what genug is? Yeah. Enough, right? Nicht genug und klar. Klar. There's no comparative in German for klar, 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 or clear. Okay? Ich habe gewarnt, aber nicht genug und klar. Und heute weiß ich, was ich and today I recognize what I was guilty of. Being too late. So it's largely up to us folks to give good example to those below 40, to all our fellow citizens, and not to lose sight of the fact that we're called to be a joyful people. And so I'd like to finish on that note by reciting to you a poem from my favorite Irish poet. It's called The Fitter of Dooney. Does anyone know it? Good. <laughs> <laughs> when I play my fiddle in Dooney, folk dance like a wave of the sea. My brother is priest in Kilvarnet, my cousin in Bach I passed my brother and cousin. They read from their book of prayers. I read from my book of songs that I bought at the Sligo Fair. We reached the end of time with Peter sitting in state. He'll call the three old souls, but he asked me first through the gate. For the good or all was the merry, saved by an evil chance. And, and the merry loved the fiddle, and the merry loved to dance. And when the folk there see me, they'll all come up to me saying, here's the fiddler of Dooney, and they'll dance like a wave of the sea. So I wish you justice in the spirit of Yahweh, Jesus, Gandhi, Dr. King. And I wish you joy in the spirit of the fiddler of Dooney. Thanks for listening. How does a president decide that he's going to act like a king and without charge, trial, jury can execute American citizens without due process of law. How can he send his attorney general before one of the top law schools of this country and say, oh, due process of law? <laughs> you know, it doesn't say judicial process. 
is no problem. We do do process for you. No, we have to thank you very much. We do 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 do. <laughs> okay. And and where is the legal community in this country? Where are the lawyers? They're just like the lawyers in Nazi Germany, and you can quote me. Where is the ABA? Where are these people? Now the Fourth Amendment, which is the one that's really up for grabs right now. I mean, they're all being. The first, the fourth, and the fifth are particularly. But you know, you need to know what the fourth, what I've, I've been on some talk shows or interviews and stuff, and it, it's amazing to me that people don't know what the Fourth Amendment says. It's one sentence, folks. Let me read it to you. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrants shall issue but upon, anybody know? Probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, probable cause, NSA is monitoring all our conversations, all our emails. Are we all probably cause, are we all probably what are we, are we all probable criminals? Okay, you know? And the, describing the particulars or the persons or places to be seized? Well, particulars? No particulars, it's just easier to collect it all up. And we'll figure the particulars later when we find a name and we'll be able to search the database. So the Fourth Amendment, so that's why I'm saying what's really good is the Washington Post even, which has become a very conservative neocon paper, is now with it. And what we need to do is seize this Kairos moment and tell the tell the you know our people, you know, look, this is a, a danger to our liberties of, of all kinds. Yes, please. Are fairly well informed. I think they're just uh, um, well. I think they're captives of what. Eisenhower called the military industrial complex. Now we should call the military industrial security intelligence media complex. Okay. It's very akin to what Mussolini described as fascism. Yeah. So, but in terms of what, what we should know about, well, I mentioned Amy Goodman. Uh, there are a couple of websites I should mention. Consortiumnews.com is. Uh, is really a very good one, uh, not only because they take my stuff and publish it, <laughs> but there's another one called Information Clearinghouse. Information Clearinghouse. Clearinghouse, which has all manner of stuff there. Really, really good. I, it's my double check to make sure I've seen everything. And you can do this stuff real easy. You don't have to read them all. And, uh, you know, I tell people that that in my new role here, retired, uh, I can get up at seven o'clock in the morning, go down and review what's on in my computer, and by nine o'clock in the morning, after I've watched Amy Goodman, I'm in the same position that I used to be at 4.30, closing time, in the CIA headquarters, having read the take for the day, okay? That's no exaggeration. And so at 9 o'clock in the morning, I can write, or I can interview, or I can make some trouble, okay? And whereas uh, be the end of the day before I'd be in that position uh, in the old regime. So you can really get yourself informed. Information Clearinghouse. Another one, of course, is warsacrime.org. Another one is Truth Out. Common Dreams is a very, very popular one. So there are a number of websites. and. Uh, um, you know, tell, you, tell your relatives, because you can become informed and it's easier than ever before. No, I think that's a really good point. And uh, I think this leads me to comment on uh, the leadership that we would look to normally to lead us in this kind of confession and repentance. And all I can say is that it's, it's a profound disappointment to me to see the institutional church with some wonderful exceptions, um, acting just like the institutional churches of Germany. They wanted to keep the churches open, you know? And to do that, they couldn't find their voice, okay? 
So this is just by way of saying that I've learned, at least from my own experience, I spent, I spent a lot of time in the 80s and 90s uh, trying to get our church to reform its attitude toward women. I have three daughters, and I became sensitized to that problem. I find it a core problem in our church. Now, the reason I mention that is because I expended all kinds of energy and psychic stuff, okay? And uh, I began to recognize it in Catholic terms as an occasion of sin. Some of you know what that means. Occasion of sin? Yeah, occasion of sin because I was just devoting too much time. I was just, a, you know, became uh, diminishing returns. It became a diversion from other justice work that I really should be doing. So what's the lesson to me? The lesson to me is that it's an occasion of sin to waste more energy on this thing. What's, what's needed is a charismatic or charism moment where you say, well, you know, it really is up to us. We are the church, you know. It really is up to us to show the leadership that is lacking in the institutions. And that's a sad commentary in a way, but you know, the way Jesus, uh, well, for one thing, Jesus never, there's no, not one iota of evidence in the Christian scriptures that Jesus ever thought that his presence in history would deprive us from worshiping with his brothers and sisters. That's number one. He didn't come to set up the Catholic Church or any other church, okay? He came to fulfill the scriptures, okay? And so this artifice that was came out of what happened in the Roman Empire and so forth, you know, you can think about what that what you want, but uh, uh, if you look for for Jesus, you know, he didn't say a heck of a lot about about bishops. As a matter of fact, he didn't say. Well, people say, well, Jesus didn't ordain any women. Uh, well, you know the answer to that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the answer to that? <laughs> they didn't order ordain any. So, not that's just not to you know we have ordained priesthood and it's a blessing. It can be a terrific blessing, and there are pockets of, of incredible charism there. But for the most part, we're on our own, folks, and we face up to that. And let's not duck it by saying, oh, the bishop or the, the cardinal doesn't do it. Well, you know, we are the church. What would it mean if we acted that way? Okay, I never thought I'd hear myself saying this. Yes, he is. Is he afraid of the generals? Yes, he is. If you want to read a good book about what happened to John Kennedy, read JFK and the Unspeakable, okay? Now that's one heck of a situation, but I think that's, that will explain an awful lot. Now should he run for president if he's going to be afraid? Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, can he possibly get a, I've checked with the doctors at George Washington University Hospital, whether they've perfected a backbone implant. <laughs> they say they're about five or six years away from that, so that's too late. So what's the bottom line? It's up to us folks. You know, as Annie Dillard, my favorite theologian, says, you know, uh, what does she say? There's only us. There never has been any other. But that's good news, because you've looked around, and you've seen what already is here, and uh, that's great, great reason for hope. So let's finish on that note, and let's get out there and do it.